Um, hi, um, I'm Ruth Benny, um, and I'm the archivist for the Wallace Correspondence Project at the Natural History Museum. Um, the Wallace Correspondence Project um, is a unique project um, that seeks to locate, digitise, um, transcribe and interpret um, all of Alfred Russell Wallace's correspondence um, and other influential manuscript material, even letters that will mention him, important letters that will mention him as well. Um, so why are we doing this project? Um, who is Wallace? Um, well, he's that guy up there next to the sinister man in the cloak. Um, <laughs> Um, and why is the um, project so important to us? Um, so I don't know if... I'm sure most of you know quite a lot about Wallace, but um, if you don't, I've just got a kind of brief synopsis of his life. Um, he was born in um, 1823 in Monmouthshire, um, and quite a, like, not, not wealthy family at all, really. Um, he left school um, early and worked for his brother's surveying firm, um, and then was hired as a teacher in Leicester, where he met um, Henry Walter Bates, who was a very important um, man in his life. Um, together, they were very interested in um, science and natural history, and particularly after reading an important publication, um, Vestiges, um, which was published in 1844. Um, this book uh, kind of put forward the idea um, that organisms had um, evolved from more primitive forms. Um, and Wallace kind of took it upon himself to explore this theory in much greater detail and kind of said to Bates, you know, let's, let's hop on a ship and go somewhere and start, like, investigating this. Um, so between um, 1848 and 1852, um, Bates and Wallace um, travelled to the Amazon um, collecting specimens of insects and birds um, and other such things. Um, Wallace collected quite a, a lot of specimens, um, which um, he all took back on a ship, um, a fateful ship, um, um, the Helen, um, for 26 days when they were in the middle of the, um, at, uh, the Atlantic, um, whilst he was just happily eating his breakfast in his cabin, um, the captain bursts in and says, I'm afraid the ship is on fire. Come and see what you think of it. So um, Wallace, you know, came and saw what he thought of it and was like, yes, the ship's definitely on fire. Um, so he managed to escape into a rowboat, um, and luckily no one died, but sadly all his specimens um, were destroyed on the ship, which was heartbreaking for Wallace, as he was never really a particularly lucky man when it came to things like that. Um, but he wasn't deterred by what happened on the Helen, um, and in 1854 um, Wallace went um, by himself to the Malay Archipelago um, and did spend eight years in the region collecting massive amounts um, of material, um, more, fi more than 5,000 of which were new species, um, which is amazing. Um, whilst he was there, um, Wallace noticed a pattern um, in the distribution of animals um, in the archipelago, which is the islands, and proposed the kind of imaginary line um, dividing the region into two parts. Um, this is now known as Wallace's line and is an amazing discovery, um, marking the boundary of animal life between Australia and Asia. Um, also, whilst he was there in 1858, um, as the story goes, he was feverish um, um, in an island, um, and he had a flash of inspiration, um, and he realised how species were evolved. Um, they changed, as he just kind of thought up himself, um, because the fittest individuals survived and reproduced, passing their um, advantageous genetics um, to their offspring. Um, so Wallace knew that Darwin was interested in this as well, so wrote to him immediately, um, and Darwin, back in, back in England, had um, been working on the same theory for 20 years, but wasn't quite ready to publish for many different reasons. Um, he sought the advice of his friends, um, uh, who determined that both men um, had been working on the same theory. So um, as soon as they could, in July 1858, um, the theories were presented um, here at the Linnaean Society. Um, and, yeah, that was... That was that, really. Um, Origin of Species was published um, quite soon afterwards. Um, but both men were quite, quite happy with each other, really. Wallace was never kind of unhappy that Darwin had published his theory, and even in one of the pieces we have at the Natural History Museum, he kind of writes that, you know, this gentleman has amazing ideas, I agree with them, you know, um, almost entirely. Um, but for many reasons, um, after Wallace's death, um, Darwin was remembered more as the um, discoverer of um, evolution by natural selection. Um, however, in more recent years, Wallace has kind of come more to the forefront um, and lots of um, articles have been published about him. Um, 
and it's we feel at the Natural History Museum it's the time that Wallace can be kind of remembered in the same way that Darwin was. Um, but one of the um, reasons why it's been so difficult for researchers to get involved in Wallace um, is because um, most of his material isn't available to view online, you know, it's kept in many different institutions. So hence the, the birth of the Wallace Correspondence Project, which um, tied into the centenary of 2013. Um, yes, so... The Wallace Correspondence Project started um, because the library bought a big collection um, in 2002 from Richard Wallace, who was one of the grandsons um, of Wallace. Um, um, and there's been a subsequent addition to that, and now we have um, the collection at the Natural History Museum, which is in those cabinets that you see um, on the bottom um, there. Um, the collection that we have at the Natural History Museum contains a vast amount of material, manuscripts, correspondence, photos, artwork... Um, his own personal library and um, we have some beetle specimens butterflies or things like that it's a really really beautiful collection um, which was catalogued by an archivist um, on Takam for archives um, so it's av all available to see in the museum itself um, and you can see all the, just the summaries and things online um, but it was felt by the project director George Beccoloni that this wasn't quite enough um, and then today's kind of interactive international society something more needed to be done um, so as opposed to just having the collection that we have here we um, wanted to digitise and make available um, all the kind of correspondence around the world that could be found um, using a kind of friendly internet portal um, to really like bring Wallace into the forefront and allow for people to explore his life, not just as a scientist and a, and a natural historian, but also all the amazing work that he did into social reform, um, land nationalisation, even, you know, the less favourable spiritualism sides of Wallace. You know, it's all really important to understanding him as a person and also him in the wider kind of Victorian sense. Um, so initially, um, high-quality um, images of all of the letters and other manuscript material in our collection was done, um, and these were made available onto the, um, the database, um, which I'll talk about um, in a second. Um, and we also work um, transcribing these, um, these letters um, to make them available. Um, and also finding letters around the world, which is a big part of my job. And we have over 100 different repositories um, where we, we source letters from and, and deal with kind of issues of public, publishing them and copyright, etc. Um, so in July 2010, the Wallace um, Correspondence Project was given a grant from the Andrew Mellon Fund um, to start phase one of the project. Um, this funding ran from um, uh, 2010 to 2014. Um, in 2011, we also got £500 to develop the website, um, which wasn't part of the initial um, project funding. Um, and then in March 2014, um, the project received another section of money for still phase one from the John Templeton Fund, um, which is kind of taking us up to May of this, of this year. Um, and we have now subsequently got um, three years more funding from the John Templeton, um, which is amazing to kind of carry on the work that we're doing and get us into phase two of the project. Um, um, so the work that's um, involved, this is um, our behind the scenes project database, um, which is a kind of bespoke Microsoft Access database, um, which is what I use. Um, the database has a, its own record structure, um, which is made up of um, the parent, which is the bit you see at the top, and the child. Um, so each parent record has a unique permanent Wallace Correspondence Project number, um, and the parent record, record sorry, records the letter packets and all the higher information levels, so you, which, you can see, which you can see there, such as the sender, um, the um, person you're sending it to, a summary, the date, um, addresses, all things like that. Um, and each parent record can have more than one child um, attached to it, um, and so when I call them a child, I mean it could be a letter, it could be an envelope, it could be enclosure, it could be in publication. So really we're trying to um, kind of show all the different things that were related to that one kind of um, letter um, and all the publications that might have been um, 
might have included that letter as well. So it's really kind of collating a whole kind of entity that, that would have involved Wallace at that time. Um, so that's, that's what I spend my days working on is this, um, this database here. Um, but going to the website, which is what the public can see, which looks like this. Um, so you, it's hosted by the Natural History Museum. And you can search for letters in many different ways, which is all related to the behind the scenes database. So you can search, if you already knew the um, WCP number, by, for some reason, say you were a, a volunteer transcriber, you can search for that here. So you could just search for that and it will come up. Or not come up. That's, yeah, there. And you can click on, click on this and it will bring you to all the information about that particular letter. So you can see you've got um, sent by, sent to, um, the, the addresses, the dates, um, who created the record, who kind of checked the record, any summaries that might go along with that. Um, and then importantly, um, in the, when you come to the, uh, the child section of the record, um, it shows who holds um, that particular letter or manuscript material. Importantly, the, the, the finding number or the reference, archivally or library reference, um, who's the copyright owner of that? Um, this is a letter from the Wallace estate, so um, it's part of that Wallace estate. Um, and then, as well as that, you can see the scan of the letter, if, if it's available. So you can see there, that's the scan of the letter. And you can also see the transcript and the scan together, which is quite a useful tool um, for researchers interpreting the letter. So you see that there. So it's really a very, you know, kind of interactive um, website where you can search not only just kind of by reference number, but you can search by people, dates, addresses, um, who owns it, and I different item types. And because we're making um, transcriptions of all the different letters and uh, manuscript material, you can also search by keyword, which is, is a really useful function. Um, so say you were looking for, I don't know, which is the place that Wallace was, it will bring up all the different um, records that will mention that in the transcriptions. Um, yep, yeah, so that's the, um, that's the public interface. Um, so this is another example of, of the Wallace letters online. Um, and we mentioned here this was um, released to the public in 2013, which marked the centenary of Wallace's death, um, which was called Wallace 100. Um, that was a really exciting year where there was lots of talks at the museum and worldwide. Um, uh, many like, articles and blogs were written about Wallace and, and the project, um, as well as a um, Bill Bailey programme that was on, on the BBC. I don't know if any of you saw that. Um, so that really kind of boosted the project and knowledge about Wallace as well. Um, so what else do we do? Uh, a big part of my work is involved with the transcription of the letters um, and this is largely done by volunteers. We have um, a huge amount of volunteers working on the project, over 120 over the course of about five years. Um, at the moment we have about 60 working remotely um, on the project um, to, via email and four that work um, with me um, in the museum. Um, they do amazing work. Um, they're all um, trained by me, either remotely or in person. And we also hold um, annual kind of volunteer days where they come in and get one-on-one -on -one training um, with our own particular protocol that um, has been developed by um, George Beccoloni, the project director, and myself. Um, and we have our own particular formatting and um, protocol that we use to transcribe the letters. Um, the letters are not just kind of, they're put... Um, Onto the, date, onto the database um, initially when they get sent to me, just check for formatting, and then they'll be checked several times after then and finally written off so that they're kind of, you know, as, the, as perfect as we can get them. Um, but there is a kind of disclaimer when you go onto the website to say, um, you know, these haven't been completely checked, so um, bear with us, really. Um, so... So this is yeah, one of my volunteers, Sophia, and this is the protocol that we use, um, which anyone can view um, online, and it, it really is kind of 
a very good protocol and it's being used by other institutions as well, which is, which is wonderful. So what, um, what lies ahead for the Wallace Correspondence Project? Um, the big um, major outcomes of the project that we have um, envisaged is that we'll have a compre comprehensive, accurate and online archive containing um, you know, correct metadata, scans and scholarly annotated transcriptions of all of Wallace's surviving letters and manuscripts. Um, we like, um, envisage to have um, a printed calendar of all of his correspondence with summaries, um, detailed, um, historically accurate summaries um, for each letter, and as well, hopefully, some you know, popular books um, to go along with the project. Um, so at the moment, there's still quite a lot of work to be done on the project, which is why we've just got this um, funding for three more years. Um, I want to improve the data quality um, on Wallace Letters Online, um, by, as I said, getting these high-level transcriptions um, written off um, and having the scholarly annotated summaries, um, improving um, the usability of the transcripts, um, including keyword searches. We're also going to have proper biographies as well um, and um, subject matter um, links on the um, website. Um, and as I'm sure many of you work in archives will know as well, the process of um, getting copyright permission is ongoing and long and tiresome, but we have made some headway um, with that, but tracing you know, people's ancestors is always very time consuming, but we're putting the work in and, and hopefully we'll get to a certain level one day um, with that. Um, as well as that, we're always on the hunt for more letters and manuscript material hidden away in archives. Um, I found one last year in a very small library in Wales um, through searching publications, for example, and they were very happy to even know that they had this letter in their collection. They didn't know that they had it before, so that was a big kind of win when something like that happens. And um, just making um, the website more kind of user-friendly, um, I personally think it hasn't, it hasn't dated um, and it still kind of looks quite fresh, but as we all know, with these kind of situations, you need to kind of keep yourself constantly modern and updated. Um, so, thank you. Yeah, I think I kind of rushed through that quite quickly. <laughs>